Bosch Kawalik, I'm Frank Blanquette. Welcome to FNX Now. We now join our KVCR TV and radio colleague for a conversation with Clinkett TV personality Alyssa London on the show Lifestyles with Lillian Vasquez. My guest is TV host, writer, motivational speaker, model, MSNBC contributor, Alyssa London. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Nice to see you. Before we talk about your newest project, The Culture Is, I'd like to learn more about you. So let's start at the beginning. You graduated from high school in Washington. Did you grow up in Washington? I did. I grew up in the suburbs of Seattle. And what was your childhood like there growing up in, in Washington? Uh, it was very sports filled as I come from parents who are track and cross country runners and also played soccer. Okay. And what kind of kid were you? Were you involved in everything or was sports your thing? I remember being very into academics and am proud to have then found my way to Nerd Nation, Stanford <laughs> University. And so I think I was first someone who really liked books and then also liked sports, but I um, didn't excel to the same extent as my sister, who ended up following my mom's footsteps of being a, a track star at Oregon State. Oh, wow. Okay. So you have athletes in your family. And as you just indicated, you went on to attend Stanford University. What was your study and focus there? It was comparative studies in race and ethnicity, because I was fascinated with how you make sense of your identity as a mixed race person, mm -hmm. and also just fascinated by how big of a deal race is in the United States in terms of our politics and the way we relate to one another. And are you a mixed race person? I am. My father is Klinkit and my mother is Czech and Norwegian. Okay. And so did you, was that your focus throughout all of college and that's what you went for and that's what your focus was? Uh, yeah, predominantly. I did study abroad in Spain and really loved learning about Spanish history. Uh, I was fascinated by the colonization of the Americas, not because it's obviously not a good thing, but just because of the way that it does reveal uh, more about indigenous history of the Americas. And I wrote an honors thesis on uh, rural economic um, development in Southeast Alaska, which then led to so my work as a, a youth board advisor for my native corporation, Sea Alaska, and was also a contributing factor into why I created Culture Story. So did you leave um, Washington and move to Alaska? I left Washington first when I attended Stanford. And then when I graduated Stanford, I went back to Seattle to work at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to apply the knowledge that I had gained in marketing and communications at Microsoft to the native community. And I found that Anchorage was a, a great place to uh, go and live uh, from just a community standpoint and also professionally. And that it proved to be that way for six years until I chose to move here to Los Angeles last summer, uh, partly due to becoming a contributor at MSNBC. And it's just um, nice to be near the LA Bureau. Right. So as you indicated, you in you moved to Alaska in 2017, you would be crowned Miss Alaska USA. During the competition, your evening gown was beautiful, but it had special significance. Can you share that? The special significance was that it showcased the vitality of indigenous culture by having a killer whale on the train that when it was over my shoulders, emulated a clinket robe that Killer Whale is my clan crest and was created by renowned Clinket artist Preston Singletary, who I respect very much and have been honored to work with in various capacities, including my children's book. Oh, what was your platform while you were carrying out your duties during your term? What was what were you working on? My platform as Miss Alaska was to showcase the vitality of indigenous culture and uh, show that it's it's beautiful that we're still here. And that I believe is still a big part of my platform, even in my role with NBC. So you're a motivational speaker as well. What's your focus or your message and who's your target audience? The motivational speaking came out of being a cultural ambassador 
appointed while I was Miss Alaska. Um, it came because I have achieved some of my dreams and continue to go after dreams. This show was a dream of mine and content that I hope that I get to build uh, on top of the show are, are further dreams. So what I uh, end up talking to people about is the, the process of, of going after your dreams, how I've found my way to it and hopefully uh, impart some, some wisdom and inspiration that even when an idea is just a seedling, that it's your instincts telling you that that's something that you can attain. And then there's things that you can do, such as sharpening your skill set in that area that help to reveal opportunities that if you stay persistent, mm -hmm. you will eventually get to your exact goal, or at least in my experience, somewhere in that realm. Well, as you indicated, you've done so much in your young life. And from where I'm sitting, it's a very young life, from modeling to acting to entrepreneurial. Did you know what you wanted to do when you left college? You had your focus and you were going for that? I honestly didn't know what I wanted to do oh. after college. Uh, I have gone through a journey in my 20s of believing in myself more and believing that my dreams are possible mm -hmm. and I have had now more indications that when there is something that I feel drawn to that it's there for a reason and that it it may come true or something similar to it well but at 22 when I was graduating I don't think I had that same level of experience to know that if you tell people what you're interested in, if you keep trying in the areas that you're trying to uh, have an achievement in, that it will lead to something. I, I think my mindset that at 22 was much more, uh, I just wanted the opportunity that, that I can get. Oh my gosh, I have a first job. Oh my gosh, it's Microsoft. I'm so grateful uh, to be able to discern which opportunities you want, I think it comes with maturity. Right. Absolutely. It's hard to know what we want to do when we first enter college at, you know, 18 and know what to do until we get there. Maybe things start to turn around or things come into our world that we start making different decisions. So from your experience at Microsoft, what did you gain there? I gained a global perspective. I was afforded the opportunity to go to Europe and see some of the Microsoft partner companies there wow. and understand that our economies are interrelated throughout the world and got to understand more about organizational structure and how much goes into making even a marketing campaign happen on a global or regional scale. So again, I, I gained a, a perspective of more of a global sense of business. Mm -hmm. So you would receive the Rasmussen Award. Will you share what that project was or what you did for that project? Yes, I'm honored to be a, a Rasmussen grant winner. Mm -hmm. That was something that I applied for with the uh, Crow Nation culture story that I created when I visited uh, when I visited the nation for uh, Crow Fair one summer. Uh, Culture Story is an example of doing as much as you can with the resources that you have and trying to have a vision come to life by continuing to work with people that are in your network or do parts of the vision just to show that you're going to keep uh, putting effort into it. So Crow Fair led to having some uh, materials that I was then able to present to the Rasmussen Foundation to be able to share the vision that I wanted funding to be able to create Culture Stories Alaska. Uh, I still am uh, looking to create Culture Stories Alaska and I'm hoping that as a result of this very beautifully done um, Culture is Indigenous Women special that I have more connections or more of a portfolio piece to be able to have something like Culture Stories Alaska happen. Um, but the Rasmussen Award was um, something to facilitate another portfolio piece of content, which ended up becoming 
the Indigenous Place Names Project Culture Story, which uh, showed some of the Native leaders in Anchorage, Alaska that are working to uh, lead the Indigenous Place Names movement, which I really hope their model for that extends beyond Alaska into the lower 48, because all land in North America is Native land, and at least we can start changing some of the names back to Indigenous names in uh, in contiguous um, United States and up in Alaska and Hawaii, they've done a pretty good job. Then mm. hopefully that would become more top of mind to people that were on native land. So it was kind of a springboard for you in in doing some of the vision that you had. So you you did mention you have a company producing cultural stories and they're on FNX. Share a little bit about cultural stories and the company and, and the series emphasis. Culture Stories is an education and media company with an emphasis on media that provides um, edutainment, as I like to call it. Uh, it is intended to showcase the beauty and vitality of Indigenous cultures and also facilitate conversations about um, cross-cultural awareness and understanding. The way that we work to do that is a culture story is created by looking at themes of everyone's culture story, but that is done through an Indigenous lens. When you ask a Native person to say who they are, they generally talk about uh, who their family is, and they go and talk about their value systems and their faith. Then you usually get an Indigenous person to talk about uh, their arts and regalia or fashion, or if it's a Native woman, maybe some some earrings or um, <laughs> even non-binary people. Just There's different pieces. that, And that's why in my show, like we start off the top by talking about regalia. So in short, we talk about the different themes that make up a culture story to then uh, look at the more specific topic that we're talking about. Uh, but the reason it's done through those themes is so that anyone, even if they're not Native, can then relate what they're learning about Indigenous culture back to their own lives in order how they make sense of their own culture story. Because I think one way we can make Indigenous content more uh, easily digestible or understood by mm -hmm. a non-Native audience is by helping to relate it to themselves. Right, for sure. Okay, so now let's talk about your current project. As the host of the MSNBC series, The Culture Is, you're the host of the fourth episode in the series. What is the project's focus, and who were your guests? So it was an honor to become the host of The Culture Is Indigenous Women. My guests are amazing, uh, trailblazing women. We have uh, the seven women at the table with me, and then we also have Congresswoman Poltola that I got to uh, interview up in Alaska and in the show you'll see me get a little emotional about that because it was just such an, an honor to be two Alaska Native women uh, getting to interface with one another for you know such a big uh, national production. The women at the table with me are um, Ali Young, a voting rights activist, um, Navajo. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Emmy award-winning um, producer uh, Jane Myers who produced Prey and then we have her uh, actress and colleague um, Amber Midthunder sitting right next to me during the show and just really respect her as a, a young leader. And then we have Crystal Echo Hawk who leads Illuminative and is just so committed to increasing um, Indigenous representation in media and television and advocating for why that's so important. We have Kimberly Teehee, who, gosh, she's so eloquent and intelligent. She's also the um, Congresswoman appointee delegate for the um, the Cherokee Nation to uphold their treaty rights. Um, then we have Nancy Shippentower, who is a Native activist uh, fo focusing mostly on um, fishing rights, but I think her activism and her family's historical activism extends uh, well beyond that. And she's such a kick, <laughs> I love her. And then we have Janae Kassanavoid, who is an Olympic hopeful and a, and a professional track and field athlete. So it was such an honor to hold space with those women. Was it overwhelming? Was it awe-inspiring? What was it for you as the host and what you were hearing and talking about? It was awe-inspiring and just gave me so much hope that we have such leaders in their various industries and fields um, for our Native youth to look up to and and also to just be able to continue to follow them and see the incredible work that they are each doing. And then the overwhelm that I think you're referring to is something I think anyone would feel you are getting the incredible privilege of having 
a, a set of period of time to <laughs> facilitate a conversation that was then getting broadcast to uh, an audience in America that doesn't always get to hear about Native Americans. And I, I wanted to get as much uh, content covered as possible. And I think that we, we did our best with the time we had and uh, that there's still a lot that comes through in the special, but also a sense that there's there's so much more to tell. So it yeah, was a good balance. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure there is. Um, will you talk about the importance of regalia in the tribal communities? Yes, regalia is incredibly, incredibly important because it is a one way that we show who we are and where we come from just by even showing up. Uh, in my case, my regalia literally tells who my family is. I have a killer whale on the back of my robe and I even did that at Miss USA because on that platform I wanted to have a killer whale to show who I am and where I come from. I think that's what regalia um, does across our indigenous communities even if it's not as overt as a clan crest it just always has a story. If you ask a native person about their regalia they'll have lots to tell you about who made it, who gifted it, uh, who they will gift it to. There's it's just a a big jumping off point when you're connecting with an indigenous person. Yeah, it's pretty special. Um, I have to say the one in the videos that I saw was just so eloquent and el so lovely, so beautiful. And the way you wore it was just so eloquent. It was just, it was just lovely. Um, Thank you. It was my favorite part of the pageant. I felt like I had my whole community on stage with me and I, I wasn't nervous in those moments because it was about something um, bigger than myself, which was about uh, showcasing the vitality of indigenous culture, whereas swimsuit, I was a little more nervous. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know why. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, regarding the special, what were the other episodes and subject matters in the first three episodes? Uh, the first three specials mm -hmm. are featuring uh, lit uh, Latina women conversation. I got to go to that. Uh, it was in Beverly Hills, and that was helpful to get to see how another host uh, facilitated that conversation. Then there was the uh, Culture is Black Women, and there's also Culture is AAPI, hosted by Katie Fang, who I got to know at the White House Correspondence Center after party this uh, this year, and just think that she's an amazing host as well. So it will be cool if in the future we get to have a panel of all the hosts of each of the four episodes or specials even bigger. It'd be cool to have then all of the women we had in our episodes with us. But, you know, who knows if that'll happen. But a girl but it read. would be nice if MSNBC said, let's bring all four women that hosted this and have that dialogue and conversation. That seems like that would be uh, pretty informative and, and interesting to bring four women again to have their conversation about that. I don't know what their plans are for the Culture Is franchise, but they definitely created a brand and we'll see if they want to continue to invest in it. I'm wondering, would you share some of the common or misinformed or misconceptions many non-natives have about indigenous people? Oh, the, the biggest one that I work to debunk is the misconception that we are a group of people that is antiquated and only existed last in the 19th century, or even maybe some of the 20th, but mostly the 19th. I think that there's a, a common misconception that the the true natives or the true Indians no longer are among, among us anymore. And I think that's perpetuated in the fact that we are even shown mostly in natural history museums next to dinosaurs. So I think that is a big misconception. I think we talked a bit about that in the show when we got into this identity and stereotypes conversation. Uh, the reason why I lead with that so much in terms of we are still here, what does it mean to be a Native person today, is just my lived experience as a mixed race Indigenous woman is that you have to explain that to people a lot. And I wanted to use that big platform to try and explain that to more people than I can on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So. And I read the idea of blood quantum maybe going away and that you're something you support. Will you share what it is? Yeah, I support the eradication of blood quantum being a metric for indigenous identity and instead go to a descendancy model and uh, uh, having it be based off of family tree and 
that's at least in my community, genealogy is incredibly important. And how it's been explained to me growing up is, you know, who your family is, you know, who you come from. Uh, the fact that we've intermarried in the more recent generations is something we've been doing since time immemorial. It's how you keep bloodlines healthy. It's also, we would intermarry with other tribes, but now the tribal system in America due to uh, colonization and genocide has shifted into us sharing our lands with other ethnic groups from around the country. But we are also not an ethnic group as Native people. We are a we are citizens of sovereign nations. And so I also think there needs to be a shift in even equating um, Indigenous people to Black people in America or API or Latina, even though we're sharing the stage with those groups of people in this culture is series. Uh, something that I, I think Crystal uh, articulated really well in the show is that we are not an ethnic group. We are a political group in America. With Blood Quantum, I hadn't heard of that. Is that something that's in the news now? Is it something that's coming about? Or is it just an early discussion about it? Uh, Blood Quantum, at least in my lifetime, has been something I hear about on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. because it's Indigenous identity is highly contentious to an extent because we have claims to land and resources. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion is that there are some groups that could have invested interests, including some Native groups, in upholding or doubling down on blood quantum as a metric for Indigenous identity because then they could have their resources be more concentrated amongst a certain group of people that are able to claim a certain level of blood quantum. I think it is a very short-sighted approach because if we just look at our population in the last 100 years, how much intermarrying has happened, right. that if you continue to uphold blood quantum, you could breed out the Indian, which if you look at some documents that uh, are not as politically correct because they are not you know, modern documents in the way that it was spoken about, it there can be a case made that that was part of the plan was to in institute blood quantum in order to have there be no more natives in the next few generations. Um, okay. But yeah, I, mm -hmm. I get it. Thank you. What do you want viewers to learn and take away from this MSNBC special? Something I would like viewers to learn and take away from this MSNBC special is that we are a very vibrant community that has a lot of stories to tell and you're getting a taste of it through the special. And so I hope that you'll see much more um, from our community across all platforms of media, including MSNBC, and that it excites you to see more. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you on a personal note, are there misconceptions that people may have of you that you face? Um, yeah, I think that that is why I've done some of the work that I've done. Um, Journey of the Freckled Indian is me confronting that head on. Um, it's about the fact that I felt bad even from a young age about being mixed race and light skinned and being proud of being Native American, but not um, living up to the perceived stereotype of what a Native person looks like. And so as I've gotten stronger and standing my ground mm -hmm. and going along with what my father and grandfather have told me of, you know, who your family is and you know who you are, then it seems to have given other people in the Native community who struggle with that permission to stand strong or feel like they have um, someone to look to, such as myself, uh, who struggles with something that they do around their identity, and then they can still continue to claim it. I really liked what Kimberly Teehee said at the dinner that, you know, her mom was a, in her words, a full-blooded Cherokee that was a Cherokee language um, speaker from, from childhood onward. And she was, uh, I think Kimberly said that her mom was uh, a, a redhead with blue eyes. So truly being indigenous is is not that we all look like a, a Plains Indian, but I've definitely confronted that. Yeah, I bet. Okay, in our last few minutes together, can we do kind of a speed round of questions? Are you game? 
I'm game. Let's okay. Do it. All right. What is something many don't know about you that might surprise them? Oh, I'm not good at the speed thing. All right. <laughs> I have, oh, that I sing and play piano and that I invest time in that hobby and I really enjoy it. Okay. A movie that you'll watch over and over. Moana. Oh, a favorite meal. Uh, halibut with asparagus. Okay. A favorite flower. Jasmine and and a really good smelling rose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A mantra that you try to live by. I'm a fighter and I'll always pull it off. No, um, go after your dreams and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll achieve it somewhere in that realm. All right, right on. Go for it. Go for that. Um, an activity you enjoy doing, but you don't get enough time to do it. Hmm. What popped in my mind was painting. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. very good. My guest has been Alyssa London. She's an MSNBC correspondent. Her special is The Culture Is, which can be seen on Peacock. Thank you so much for being a guest on Life Styles. Thank you. It was great to be here. For Lifestyles, I'm Lillian Vasquez. Thanks for watching, and bye for now. This program was originally produced for 91.9 KVCR Radio. Yeah, the simple things in life. Great show, Lillian. Thank you to you and your guest. For FNX Now, this is Frank Blanquette. Dios Boutique. Thank you for watching.